Hey YouTube, today we are finally gonna do our Q&A that I promised from Instagram, so I'm excited to answer. I think I'm gonna answer about, we'll see. I always try to answer about 15 questions, but I'm kinda long-winded, so we'll see if I can get through all 15. But first, there's a big snowstorm coming to me here in the Sierra Nevada mountains, and I have this giant cedar tree that I fell a couple of weeks ago, and if I leave it on the ground underneath snow, it's pretty much just gonna absorb and soak up all of that water and I won't really be able to access it on the ground. So I'm gonna get that done first, then I gotta go to the grocery store. So in the midst of all this chaos on this Sunday, we're gonna try to get as many questions answered as possible. Alright guys, so day kind of got away from me a little bit, um, grocery store took a long time, it's still super crowded, not sure why, and of course as you guys know, it's not a short drive, it takes me quite a while to get to the grocery store and back, so long story short, we're going to get started now with our questions, even though it is exactly 1.20, 7pm, so a little later than I wanted to start, but I'll get, so the first question is, what type of wood do you prefer chopping and why? I'm not going to do a lot of wood questions, so don't worry, this is the only one I'm going to do. But it is a common question, and so I'll let you know. Where I live in the Sierra Nevada mountains, we have a lot of different species of trees, but most of them are conifers because of how high up, how high up I am. And if you don't know, you know what a conifer looks like, just when you go to the mountains and you see a lot of tall trees with a lot of green on them, cedar, pine, stuff like this here, those are conifers. We have a lot of them here, but I do not burn pine inside. I love cutting up pine and burning it with my friends outside when we're having a burn pile and stuff, but you know, ultimately speaking, there's too much sap in it and it just makes a big mess inside of your flue or your chimney and it causes you to have to clean a lot. So we burn, specifically people in this part of the country, like to burn cedar as your starter to get the house warm and we like to burn oak. Oak burns clean, it burns long, um, but unfortunately even here where I live because of the elevation, you don't get a ton of oak. So you sort of have to compensate with your cedar um, and burn the cedar for a little longer into the evening and then add the oak right before bed. So that's what I burn. They're straight grain, so they cut pretty simply by hand and I don't have to, I've gotten good enough where I don't have to use a wood splitter. So I hope that was a good enough answer for you. Cedar and black oak, those are the two species I cut. Um, next up, there's a lot of good questions by the way, so I like to filter through them real quick and not bite off more than I can chew. Um, Let's see, what makes you roll your eyes every time you hear it? Um, it's not so much hear it, but see it. Um, right now in the fitness industry, a lot of people are getting excited. They get excited, uh, jump head first into fitness, and that lifestyle is great. I mean, I went to school for six years to get a master's degree in physiology, so I think I like it too. But here's the problem. So many of these people, these influencers, these fit influencers are so one-dimensional and boring I just can't do it, man. And they make this this whole fitness gym life thing their whole journey and they make it about their, that's the, all their identity is. All they can talk about is gym, supplements, sometimes drugs depending on the individual and then of course workout clothes and they talk about how it's their therapy and this and that which is, it's good and it's bad. Um, I'm happy people are finding that exercise helps them but I'm really not really not a fan of the all in and having nothing else to your identity, nothing else to your personality, nothing else to your endeavors. Fitness is great, but it's like 2% of your day. Seriously, so just do better. You know, I'd like to see those people do better and be about more than that. So yeah, hobbies are important, keep that in mind. <clears throat> Next one, sorry. How planned out were your tattoos? Do you consider yourself artistic? Would you consider uh, performance wood cutting? <laughs> Three questions, so I'll try to address them quickly on this one. Uh, my tattoos are very rarely planned out much at all. When I got them, I was in my early 20s, most of them I got in my early 20s, and I just would grab onto some symbolism that I thought was cool, related to something I was going through that day, that week, that month maybe, get a tattoo and move on with my life. So yeah, I didn't, I didn't go in with a plan to like change my appearance with this huge sleeve or like clocks and lions and smoke and all this cheesy stuff. I would just got tattoos as I was feeling it. So that's how it ended up. So it really just was more of a yearbook type situation that turned into more. 
So that's why you see my sleeves are pretty uniquely kind of sparse and separated. That's why. Um, do you consider yourself artistic? No, but I am pretty creative. So I, I don't do a lot of, I drew my tattoos, but I'm not a drawer by any means. Um, musically, I'm pretty musically inclined and I really like creating music, but it's not my number, number one endeavor in life. So it's just something that is a nice little, those side hobbies we were talking about. So I like creating music. Um, with friends, one of my best friends is extremely talented as an acoustic artist, and then we'll just get together. Uh, his name is Todd. We'll just get together and we'll make for fun. We'll just make beats and fun stuff like that. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. Um, a lot of people would assume all I listen to is country music, and while I do like some country, I'm actually a really big uh, rap California rap fan, and I like a lot of music outside of those genres for sure too. So, would I consider performance wood cutting? So that's the third part of this question. Not only would I consider it, I think I'm going to start doing it in a couple months once winter's over, um, just as another fun little hobby to do. I did do it as a kid. I did do some events at like log jamborees and stuff like that, but I never took it super seriously. I do know how to climb and fell trees, and I think I'd be pretty good at the horizontal chop. Uh, and you know, there's a couple of events I would do good with steel timber sports. So yeah, looking forward to that, but not today's endeavor. That's for a couple months down the road. Sorry, next question. We have, um, while working out and moving towards your goals, do you experience body dysmorphia? And if so, how do you push through it? One, yes. I think most humans, to some degree, have experienced a little bit of body image issues, but body dysmorphia is the idea that you look completely different than you actually do in reality. Um, one thing that's really bad for my body dysmorphia is I really enjoy the sport of, not the sport, but the, I guess the endeavor of extreme, like serious bodybuilding. But personally, I don't want to do that. I don't want to put myself through all the drugs. I don't want to get that big. I don't want to be that bad at defending myself. I don't want to be that bad at moving my body. Um, unfortunately, it's not practical for the world that I live in. It's a little bit more rough around the edges and it wouldn't make sense to get super big. Um, but I am a fan of it. So if I get into watching or reading too many magazines or looking too much into the details of the individuals that participate in competitive bodybuilding and take drugs, it can be very tough for me to feel good about my own body because I'm not on drugs and the, the look is completely different. But I always remember um, there's one of my really good friends was a big time bodybuilder and he did take steroids to get to his size. He never was world class, but he was big, huge. Um, and we worked out together. It was my workout partner. So it was weird to see him and me standing next to each other with the same capabilities, yet he was so much larger than me. And I remember one day he told me that, because he was huge, I mean, very big guy, probably 230, 240 and shorter than me, so much thicker than me. And I remember one day we were hanging out and he told me that he wished sometimes that he just had my body because it was so much more aesthetically pleasing in his eye and that it looks so much better and more natural and realistic and stylistic. And he seemed, he thought life would sometimes just feel more fitting for him to look like that. Now, obviously he could stop taking the drugs. Unfortunately, sometimes that's not always an option, but he could have stopped taking the drugs. But it's crazy to think that someone can get so deep inside of their hobby that they're willing to make themselves uncomfortable in their own skin uh, and push through it to get there. So I thought to myself at that moment and realized damn, it doesn't matter where you're standing and where you get to, you're always going to wish you looked like somebody else in small moments of your life. So that's the one of the only moments that ever kept, it's funny because he's a really nice guy um, and we don't really talk anymore, not because of bad news, just life happens. Um, but he changed the course of my decision making pretty severely by just saying that one thing. It just really hit home because it just hit me at the right time and I realized, damn, I could work towards getting as big as I possibly could and I'm still gonna look upon other people through a different lens, through a different perspective. So just remember that if you wake up in the morning and one of the first things you're concerned about is what your body is looking like that day, um, you're, you're getting a little too deep inside your hobby, a little too deep inside your head. It should be a side effect of a passion and you should have a passion first. And then of course, little tidbits here and there, I'll critique myself now in front of a mirror when I'm working out and think, oh, while I'm in the gym, you're like molding the clay and trying to change the shape of my body. I'm all for that. I'm all about that. As soon as I step outside of the gym, I'm just thorn and it's time to stop critiquing the way I look um, every second of the day. 
and just remember that there are some small goals that are okay to hit, but ultimately speaking, the number one goal is comfort, happiness, and just being, um, just being really content with where you're at physically for the day, because at the end of the day, it's not gonna change um, within a few hours. It ain't gonna change within a month even. So you better find a way to love the way you look now and then work on the rest later. So just keep that in mind. I know that's not necessarily advice, but it's just a little peek into how I feel sometimes. Um, I'm, I know by no means am I a world-class physique, but I look like this year round. And I'm one of the only fitness models I know that isn't doing that all the time. So obviously something I do is sustainable. Obviously there's a reason why I'm the person you can call uh, the day after Thanksgiving and still do a photo shoot. Shout out to Cellucor because I did that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so the consistency shows because I'm able to do it and I don't fluctuate. So I, I'm pretty proud of that. I'm gonna get inside. Today's actually my cheat meal day, my refeed day, um, which we could talk about a little bit of that later, but I need to shower. I'm covered in tree sap, um, pretty dirty, so it'd be nice to get kind of cleaned up and then we'll finish this Q&A, so let's go. This is Ollie, Oliver. More of an idea than he is a dog. This is Bobby. More of a dog with no ideas. Love them both. If you guys have never met them, there you go. The question of the year is why do you have the types of dogs I have, I guess, because I only like small dogs. Um, and I don't need a big dog to do anything for me. I'd rather my dogs just be all social and comfort and this is exactly what these guys do. They are not workhorses and they're not really capable of much. They just eat, sleep, and relax. So, hey, we're gonna start the video. Okay, so here we go, next question. I'm all showered, I'm ready to go. Um, into the woods she goes is the username. She wants to know, Bradley Thor, how do you balance online versus home life? Now I think the interpretation of this for most people would be work-life balance, um, but I think what she's really getting at is how do you balance the work-life situation when you might, it's hard to say this humbly, I don't know how to say it, but like say you're someone who could be recognized in public, how do you balance that with like a normal home life? Um, and it's really easy, honestly. Where I live, where I interact, the friends that I interact with, uh, the, the world that I came from does not care about social media, and I mean that they still really don't care about social media. I think a lot of the kids I grew up with, their parents probably care more about Facebook than the rest of us care about social media when it comes to leveraging in the things that are really important in life. So let me be very clear. I'm not saying I don't like social media. I'm not saying it's not good for some things. I'm saying that in the world of needing oxygen, in the world of needing food, social interaction, um, a romantic life, and the real world where we have real things to accomplish every single day, um, you have to have these layers of importance. And being Thor, Thor and Bradley, um, in my everyday life, gives me no advantages, no uh, special treatment. The world around me treats me no differently than any other human walking around, so that's an important part of being grounded. Um, and then an, another important piece to that too is to understand I came from a world where I didn't use social media. I didn't use social media sincerely until I was like 25. So that's a long time in your life to experience what it's like to not be logging on all the time and checking in on what people think of you. So I knew what the world was like before and it helped me a lot. I do feel for people who are growing up in today's day and age and not knowing what it was like without it. Um, and these people take like these hiatuses from social media because they're so engulfed in the politics, in the drama, in the constant negativity. You'll notice I don't do that. I just don't. I use social media very differently than the average millennial um, and it pays off. I use it for interactions, for significant positivity. I use it to help people, to reach people. And the people who want to go mudsling on social media can do it elsewhere. I just don't engage. And it really does help me a lot separate um, from social media because then it's just a place of positivity for me and it doesn't bleed into the rest of my life. So, yeah, i got enough challenges and heartache and other things to deal with in life on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't need to be bringing in other people's as well. So, yeah, I think that's, that's how I do it. Do you know what your purpose in life is? If so, how do you find it? Jeez. Dan 
I don't know how to pronounce your last name. It looks like your name's Danny or Danielle. I, sorry if I got it wrong, Danny. Um, that's just a guess. This is a pretty deep question. Um, it's hard to prepare for questions that are this deep. I didn't make a list of ones that are easy to answer. I just threw them all on my phone and I'm answering at random. So thanks for throwing a wrench in, <laughs> in, the, in the flow, but I'll just be honest with you. I don't think we have a purpose. Um, I don't think you're born with some innate need or purpose in life. Our cells, our bodies, um, this world is all a pattern of it's hard to explain how what that would even mean, a pattern of randomness that sort of doesn't make sense to put those two words side by side, but I do believe that that's the case. I think that um, things are just happening in the world and then your proximity to those things is what your brain attributes meaning to. So um, we like to attribute meaning to things after they happen, but the truth is, is it's really just a chemical sort of interaction that we are with the world where when things happen we like to assign them meaning and the truth is I don't think anything has a purpose or a meaning. I think that your consciousness, your awareness and your just sense of self is doing that work for you to decide what the purpose is. Now that's not to be so, don't take that dark, don't take that as like some you know horrible atheist approach at life, that's not what I'm trying to get at. In fact I think it's actually oddly beautiful how cool it is to relinquish some of those stressors about things needing to have a purpose um, because then when things do go wrong and go poorly in your day or in your week you don't have to think that somebody is doing this to you and it's much easier to cope with that way if you understand that things are just happening in the world um, sometimes you roll the dice and you get three snake eyes in a row sometimes you roll the dice and it's just a really weird setup you get fours and threes and fives and whatever but the truth is, is that you're just going to get, sometimes there's going to be a consistency of positivity around you, sometimes there's going to be a few negative things that happen in a row. Um, you can assign the meaning that you want to assign to those things and then react the way you want. So just take more ownership, I think. I'm not giving you advice, Danny, but just to everyone else listening. Take more ownership over your purpose, over your meaning, and understand that thinking that we have this purpose is much different than allowing yourself to create your purpose. So. I think that's important to understand. I don't think it's a divine choice. I think it's something you decide. Um, the best bit of advice I've ever received, I'll keep this one short. I was two years into college, hating it. All my friends were working blue collar jobs and making money and going to school. I wasn't making much money because I couldn't work as much because I was going to school. Um, I was paying my way through schools, doing jobs here and there, tree work um, and landscaping type stuff and stuff like that. And uh, I couldn't do it anymore. I was surrounded by kids whose parents were paying their way through school. These kids were driving BMWs, showing up to class in their pajamas. And I was just trying to figure out how to live and stick it out for another couple years. And I called my mom, just done, tired of it, couldn't do it anymore, um, ready to walk away that day, middle of the semester too. And I called her and I said, hey, I don't know if I can do this anymore. And she said, that's fine, don't. She said, just go one day at a time from now on, and if you get to a day where you can't handle it anymore, quit. And I remember thinking, that's oh, weird advice from a parent to tell you in the middle of school, in the middle of college to quit something, but she just was getting at is, you're always allowed to walk away from something. You're always allowed to quit. You're always allowed to stop a profession. She said, don't worry about um, maintaining some sense of who you are, being this student and finishing your bachelor's. If you don't wanna do it, fucking stop and she doesn't cuss but I do uh, she said just stop and I woke up the next day and I was the best student from that point forward in the in, in the entire school I guarantee it because I was going into it with this new mindset where no one else is expecting me anymore to finish school I'm just here because I am paying for it and I want to get a degree and it changed my perspective I could quit any time and no one was gonna ask me to stick it out no one was gonna say they were let down no one was going to expect me to keep going, and it felt amazing. So I started applying that to the rest of my life. You don't have to be in the relationship. You don't have to work that job. You don't have to go to school. Um, straight up, the best advice I ever got is that you are allowed to stop doing whatever you're doing at any time, whenever you want. You're allowed to. So once you realize that, maybe you'll start making some decisions, uh, important decisions in life about where not to waste your time anymore. Let's do one more, and then I'm hungry. I need to go eat lunch.
Um, do you adjust training styles for men versus women? If so, what are those differences? Easy. I love this one. Um, I do, but they're very small changes. One, we have to understand the female hip, knee, and ankle complex is much different on a, a average basis from female to male. Does that have huge implications on how you would train them? No, not huge ones, but it has some. Here's the thing. Females will benefit intensely because of their bone structure, because of the hip shape, the width at the hips and stuff like that. They will benefit greatly from you doing more single leg movements for overall tissue and strength. That's Bulgarian split squats, step back lunges, Cossack squats, single leg leg press, um, so on and so forth. We could go on all day lunging. Um, these are all movements that I love uh, and it'll help people build tissue but more importantly it'll be a lot better for a lot of women in their um, needs and their adaptation from the ankle, knee, and hip complex. There's more to it than just that, but simply speaking, you can bypass the hips and get straight into the tissue and the muscle you'd like to grow in certain areas of the limbs. Um, I also believe there's less of a CNS toll, and of course, structurally, hey, structurally, it's a lot better on the spine to take some breaks from the squatting and deadlifting. Um, it doesn't mean you don't want to squat and deadlift, it just means that there's options to mix in other movements. Hey, enough! Sorry, these guys are going nuts. Okay, next. I do change one more thing with women and men, and that's you have to understand that monthly, for most women, each month there are going to be about two days, maybe three days, where their body is very run down. Now I've found, through some professional research, but also through some experience of helping people out, uh, for a long time being a strength and conditioning coach in the NCAA, I would find with my female athletes that I needed them to tell me if they were starting to feel run down for their menstrual cycle. Because um, when the period comes, the two days before your period, you're going to be really run down. Really run down. Tired, vulnerable in uh, an injury sense. You're going to be weak, maybe low on minerals, stuff like this come about and you have to keep that in mind for training. So my general recommendation for women is that for those two days before your period, do not train through the pain, do not train through the discomfort, do not ramp up the volume to be some sort of a martyr for hard work, don't do that. If anything, bump the intensity up and take the volume down. So instead of doing four sets of 10 like you would normally do, maybe you do three sets of 10. That's 25% less of your working sets, give your body a chance to actually recover. If you wake up and it feels like a bad idea to go lift that day, it is a bad idea to go lift that day. Go do some cardio, go do a little bit of abs, go back home. So yeah, that's my advice for women, mainly the big differences between men and women. Um, here's the plan for the rest of the video today. I'm going to go cook, I'm going to go eat, I'm going to go watch a few episodes of a show, something on Netflix, and then we'll come back either here or maybe where the fire is at, where it's nice and warm and we'll finish our last four questions. All right guys, thank you. How long was that? Oh man. Okay guys, it is no secret that it's clearly not the same day. Uh, this was supposed to be a Sunday Q&A and what do you know, I um, had to drag it out to Monday so now it is Monday night. To give you guys a little context into the fact that this is obviously not the same day, but it is the same video, so we're going to keep it going. I'm going to keep answering questions until we get through at least five more. That is my personal goal. Now, you know, I think we've done a good job answering some questions, but what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to um, get a few questions mixed in that are shorter and quicker. I know I talk a lot and that bodes really well for YouTube because I can easily make a 35 minute video of just me answering one question, but I wanna get into the habit of trying to speed it up for you guys. So let's see how many I can get through. There'll be some long ones and hopefully one or two short ones. Let's go. Um, I think we left off on a question about purpose, so it was pretty deep. Let's see if we can not get to some shorter questions here. How to determine, Sandra wants to know, how to determine the number of rest and recovery days per week and options for rest and recovery modalities besides the couch? Amazing question. Um, and this is going to be one of those ones that is kind of cliche in the beginning, but then I'll do you the favor of explaining it deeper to help you understand how to apply it to your life. 
Now most fitness influencers are going to give you the cheesy run around about how you need to rest to grow, um, rest is the most important part of it, all those cliches, which is great, it's true. But the truth is, is to determine how many days you need, you first need to determine how many days are you wanting to work out. Now if you're wanting to work based on your schedule, you're, um, sometimes you're a head case and you need to work out every single day to really get it in line, then you're going to have to figure out how to reduce the volume of each workout so that you're recovering from each one of those sessions. So if the frequency is seven days a week, then the volume for each one of those workouts needs to be much smaller so you're actually, actually recovering. Um, so then you just, from there we will derive how many days are you wanting to work out? Do you see yourself only making it to the gym three days a week? Well then guess what? There's going to be about two or three recovery days based on math. There's going to be about two or three recovery days. So you're going to just determine first how many days do you want to work out? Boom, you got that figured out. How many days are you actually going? So reassess in a month. How many days were you going on average per week? And then plan your rest days that way. Now I'll tell you what's kind of worked for me. I plan seven workout days of the week. If I make it to the sixth and I never missed a day, because life happens and sometimes, rarely for me, I mean it rarely happens, but sometimes a day gets pulled because something comes up. Guess what? You still have that seventh day perfect and then I can take that rest day on that seventh day if I didn't take one on any other day. If I did end up missing Wednesday, then I added in on Sunday. Um, that's what's always worked best for me, so maybe that'll work for you. Um, and as far as recovery is concerned, please don't do cupping. doesn't work. I can get into that another day. We don't have the time today. Um, please don't do cupping. Ice baths are great, but they're not great from recovery from a workout. They're actually great as a standalone modality. Um, once again, we can get into that another day because um, the protein you know, spiking that it causes is great, but it's also irrelevant to a workout session. Um, you don't want to shunt inflammation after a workout. So once again, uh, a different study, different day, we can talk about another time. What you do want to focus on is just getting some fresh blood flow going into the areas that are sore. So let's say two days after leg day, you're torn up, you can't use your legs, what should you do? Some light body weight squats, some light lunging, some good mornings, a little bit of a maybe a, a light low impact cardio, Stairmaster or something. Get some fresh blood flow in there and then get out the door. Best way to go. And I promise that's the best way to, to go. You will get rid of soreness so much quicker by warming that muscle back up again. Which music is guaranteed to give you goosebumps every time and why? I'll keep this one short. It is a song called Rocky Road to Dublin. Um, and it is done by a lot of people. I think the version I like is on Spotify and it was done by the High Kings. It is not the type of music everybody would like to listen to for a workout session. I don't even really listen to it for a workout session, but something about your DNA really speaking to you. I'm very Irish in heritage, so I don't know what it is, but when I hear um, that Irish music come on, man, it just fires me up in a way nothing else ever will. I'm sure a lot of Mexican viewers could say right now that if like Vicente comes on, that they get that same feeling. So um, yeah, yeah, I think it would be that song for sure. So look it up, The High Kings, Rocky Road to Dublin, pretty extreme music. Um, considering the number of fad diets that are and have been, how, how unsustainable they are long term, do you think we'll get to a point as a society where they will no longer have their place? I still get people who try and tell me I need to eat keto and cut carbs. Yeah, don't cut your carbs out completely. Um, if you ever, you want to give yourself a base, a foundation to go from. So if you're always keeping carbs in your system, you're always capable of using that as, as energy for your workouts. You're always capable of going somewhere from there. So pulling carbs when you want to cut a little weight or adding them when you want to build a little muscle and not in the state where you're completely insensitive to carbohydrates. So we don't want that either. Um, so I like that you finished with that. But no, I don't think we'll ever get to a place where people aren't looking for an easy way out because people like to tribalize and be a part of a team. And when they get into the fitness space, nobody likes to say, hey, I just learn from uh, reading and researching and watching what works for uh, for other people. I try it. If it works for me, I keep it. If it doesn't, I toss it because that's boring and nobody likes boring. People like to be a part of a team um, and that team came about with CrossFit. It was huge. You saw what happened there. People like to say, I do CrossFit. Not, I went for a workout today and then wait for someone to ask you, what kind of workout did you do? 
Oh, I kind of do some cross training. No, people will tell you straight up, I do CrossFit. I am keto. I eat vegetarian. Um, nobody who's a vegan out there would admit, hey, yeah, you know, like once a week I'll eat a little red meat, but I try to stay away from meat, just generally speaking, because they want to take ownership over the fact they're part of a team. So they want to say they're on a team. They want to say, I'm vegan, I'm vegetarian, I'm keto, because it makes them feel like it's part of their identity. I recommend, however, that you don't do that. Be boring. Be boring like me. Because when you're boring, you allow yourself to be flexible. And there might be a day that comes about where I'm not around meat and I eat vegan for a day, or I feel, hey, you know what, it'd be kind of cool to eat vegan today and just give it a, that's fine. I leave that door open for myself. Um, and allow yourself to have bigger parts of your identity than what you eat and how you work out. That's my biggest recommendation. But no, I don't think that day will ever come. Carlos, um, shout out Carlos, big help uh, with the Oak app. What's the most common misconception people have about you? Um, it used to be uh, they, would, they were surprised when they'd meet me and find out that I had a social media. So because of who, how they knew who I grew up, the way I grew up, um, a lot of people who knew me would be like, damn dude, I just saw you had an Instagram, that's crazy. You're like in, uh, you know, shirt off, doing all that stuff, doing like modeling stuff, that is so cool. And people took it as like this cool little nugget of information about me. Um, and they were surprised because being someone who was in academia, who was from blue collar roots and all that stuff, they were just surprised to see that side of me. Now it's the complete opposite. Um, people find me, know about me, learn about me through social media first, and they just assume they know everything about me because I'm somebody who takes their shirt off, um, who is a fitness model, who you know has a large following on different apps. So. Then they're surprised to find out that, oh shit, this dude used to you know, work in tree industry or this dude um, has a master's degree and he's actually smart and published and worked in academia. Holy shit, you were actually a real strength and conditioning coach in the NCAA. People are finding out that the intelligence is something they're assuming doesn't exist, that my background is something that doesn't exist, that I'm just some um, cold, like cut person that is just a fitness model and they're so surprised to find out more about me so it flipped, the script flipped. The more people that found me on the internet, um, the more it started to bury the bits of me that people actually only knew about before. So that's pretty interesting I'd say. People just assume, you know. This Eve wants to know, so I read this comment, uh, I'm going to skim, I skimmed it and I'm just going to answer it and you guys will see it, I'll put it up in the actual video. Her name is Eve. Awesome name. She wants to know, uh, she has a bodybuilder friend. Sounds like he is very large, not in a bad way. He's very muscular. Um, it sounds like he's a serious bodybuilder, so he likely has taken steroids, um, performance enhancing drugs, anabolics, nothing against it. But as far as health is concerned, these bodybuilders always get to a place where they have to then rediscover the healthy version of themselves and undo some damage. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that damage cannot be undone. Um, but you can mitigate some of the longevity um, problems by just reliving a healthy life. Now this is, the problems he's dealing with are the very similar problems that I worked to avoid by not taking steroids, eating well, um, not force feeding myself, and keeping cardio in my life, and then of course having a very active lifestyle. The typical bodybuilder lifestyle is rice and chicken, rice and chicken, rice and chicken, uh, binge eat here and there, shoot you know a lot of uh, drugs into your body and which is fine like I said but it is a risk how do you mitigate that well I think the best thing for him to do is to back off get onto a very very basic doctor prescribed and watched lifestyle where they've got him on a base of testosterone something to just keep his test levels around because his body's likely not going to produce it anymore on its own um, I'm not going to get into the details, I'll let a doctor decide that for you, although that will help a bunch. I would say I highly recommend that he does uh, at least five days a week, he gets in some light, low and slow cardio from a health perspective, starts really working on some functional movement, um, strengthening of the hips, the areas that will help support a lot of the possible joint damage he's done over the years, get really excited about another hobby, and then find one other place to invest his identity into that is a longevity based type thing. Relaxing, calming, fishing, hiking, something in that carpentry, something that is healthy for the mind, the body, the soul, but also puts him in a position 
to not have constant identity crisis every time he has to lose a couple pounds of muscle that he worked so long to work on. And just remind him how awesome he's going to look. Tell him I said so. He's going to look awesome. When he pulls back some of that very large muscle and pulls into a more aesthetic physique, the longevity will be accompanied by a great look too. So yeah, the identity crisis part is tough for a lot of professional bodybuilders, but just remind him how awesome he's going to look. Um, thoughts on tracking only protein? Angie wants to know. I am not sure that that is a good method if you have weight loss goals. That is not a good method to carry about if you have specific goals in mind. Tracking only your protein is like um, only 33% of the macronutrient you know, intake we need to be tracking. Um, fats carry a big punch, not in a bad way, but we have to monitor fats when we have weight loss goals. And protein, interestingly enough, when you chase the goal of protein, you're going to accidentally bring a ton of fat on board with you. Um, not on your body, but just in your diet, and then of course indirectly that will cause a lot of intake in your body, so or a lot of storage in your body. Keep in mind, if you're trying to eat 150 grams of protein a day, a lot of people will turn to things like salmon, which is great, chicken thighs, and beefs that aren't as lean as you think, going to stores or restaurants and uh, eating protein bars that have 15 grams of fat here that you didn't even keep in mind. It is very easy to overeat when you go that direction. Now here is one recommendation I'd say. If you're taking a hiatus for a month, let's say 30 days, 45 days of time where you're taking a hiatus from tracking too rigidly and you just want a kind of makeshift break. Tracking just your protein is an awesome way to do that because you're still going to make sure you're keeping on the muscle you want to keep on. You get to be a little loose with what you worry about uh, but not completely fall off the wagon. So I would say for momentary lapses in time when you don't have any specific goals, tracking your protein is a great way to kind of find a happy medium. But no, if you have a specific weight loss goal, please do not do that. Uh, we'll do one more. Have you ever struggled with mental health? If so, how do you overcome it? I struggle with mental health every single day. Mental health is not a, um, and this is in a preaching session, I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist. This is my perspective. Mental health is um, like brushing your teeth. It's like showering. It's like any of us who have to shave regularly, um, anything like that, it is a part of an everyday process that you work on. Um, the hardest part about mental health is the expectation that as you achieve things, your mental health gets better, and it doesn't. Your mental, my mental health is in the exact same place today as at some point as it was when I was poor, broke as shit, trying to make my way through college and just survive, and I was literally trying to make $7 work for dinner. Um, for two dinners. Uh, mental health was the same then as it is now and I'm doing much better in life. I own a home. Um, I'm, you know, by no means am I wealthy but I'm doing well um, in life and I'm figuring things out and yet I still struggle every single day with finding my baseline for my mental health. So here's the thing we have to understand. You make it a habit to check in with yourself, ask how you're doing and communicate with the people in your life and you'll always be okay because you'll be very open and transparent. As soon as you start trying to hide how your mental health is, as soon as you start trying to feel like, as soon as you start feeling like you're burdening other people by speaking with them, you're going to start carrying a heavier backpack every day. Because every single day that comes about in your life, a brick is thrown at you and you go, okay, this is another burden of new stressors, new concerns. Here's the brick or the rock that I earned today. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to use it to build something or are you going to put it in a backpack, not deal with it and carry it? And if you keep doing that by not speaking with people, that's like the equivalent of just continuing to throw those bricks in your backpack and then one day it just breaks you. So you're never going to get to a place where those bricks stop coming. Tomorrow there's going to be a new brick. The next day there's going to be a new brick. You've got to get to a place where you're finding places to build things with those bricks that come about. And if you don't speak with people, those bricks are just going to pile up in a, a messy, unorganized way and it's going to kill you. Uh, quite literally, it's going to kill you. So just remember that mental health is a daily process and as you communicate, as you cope with things, it'll get better. Um, you'll get better at dealing with it. Let's see if I can find one more because that went really quick. Uh, we got through a lot and I'm in no hurry right now. So let's do another one. If I can find another one. You guys killed it, by the way, with the Q&As on Instagram. 
Um, I couldn't be more flattered by how many people have awesome questions. We got that one done. Let's see, find a couple more. Um, the purpose one was awesome. It was a little deep, so I'm not going to go back into those types of questions right now. How do you keep your life on track and remain energetic on a daily basis? Well, first you have to ask yourself, what does track even mean? So I'm just going to revisit that last question and remind you that being on track is just being healthy, capable of attacking another day of challenges and making sure that those challenges as they're getting completed are leading you to a direction that you'd like to live. So don't take on things and challenges and problems of a career or a life or a work style that is going to lead you to a path of a life you don't want to be living in. So as long as you're going in a direction that has genuine meaning to you, you're doing well. You're doing well. Just keep checking in with that. Make sure that the GPS is pointing in the direction for a reason that serves you. Um, let's see. Go-to for maintaining my mental health is getting quiet time um, where you're not absorbing any information. A lot of my longtime followers know that. Um, so, yeah, keep that in mind. I always give myself at least an hour every day where there's no stuff coming in. No videos, no sound, no music, no words. That way you can cope with the ones that are up here and not take on other people's concerns. Even music has life struggles, strifes, concerns, other people's things, other people's business. Don't take on other people's shit for at least an hour a day. Um, Cameron Hauser, who is a good friend of mine, um, wants to know... <laughs> well, he had two really good questions. I'll post one of them that I'm not going to answer here because we're not... <laughs> Don't get the right place for it. But the other one, you guys can just laugh at it. The other one he wants to know is a great way for a lean guy to gain muscle. There's three. Caloric excess, make sure you're eating more than you're spending. So you got to find out how much energy you're spending. Two, mechanical load. Put your body under a significant mechanical load four days a week at least. Um, we're talking about a good decent amount of weight training. We, so we got food excess of clean food. We got weight training and then this weird third one that you guys are going to think is BS. Creatine gets way too much hype. I'm going to say it. I'm going to get attacked for it. I don't really give a shit. Creatine is an amazing supplement, but it's usually sold as a muscle building supplement. And more than anything, we're talking about just an energy substrate that is really helpful for maximum performance, which then indirect, indirectly will help you build muscle under heavier loads. But in the grand scheme of things, it's often overpriced, oversold, over talked about. If you're looking to put on genuine, just lean tissue, it's actually leucine, I think everybody should be looking at. Now, leucine um, is heavily researched too, heavily backed, heavily supported. But leucine is going to trigger, right outside the cell, is going to trigger, trigger a cell signaling cascade called the mammalian target of rapamycin, which then will down uh, signal protein synthesis, and then crosstalk and shut off AMPK, which is where you break down tissue. So if you could take a little bit of leucine, five grams a day, weight train, rest, and eat enough, you're going to grow like a weed. So I very rarely will hype up a, 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 a substance as your answer, but that one will actually be a quick little hack that will help you put on tissue a little bit quicker. Um, and it's underrated. So this is the last one. She is a user of my app, Oak. Uh, for those of you who you know, have never used my app before, I'm going to link it here in the description of the video. Oak, O-H-K. It's taking over. People love it. Programs, custom macros, therapies, all for like 15 bucks a month. And I'm never going to raise the price. So here's the last question. Your no bullshit attitude really speaks to me and wish I was more like you in that sense. Have you always been this way or have had you go through a time or times when you were full of self-doubt or always worrying about what others were thinking. One, we all worry about what others are thinking and people that tell you otherwise are fucking liars. Two, it's just deciding what's more important in a situation for the direction you're wanting to go. I want to end up being a better version of myself that reflects the things I love and care about. If I prioritize what other people think, I will become what they idolize what they care about, what they want. And then one day I will wake up as a version of myself that does not reflect the me part. Hey, sorry, the dogs are going nuts again. 
I am thoroughly, thoroughly confident in the fact that everybody has moments of non-bullshit and has moments of, hey, I'll take a little bit of bullshit today, um, I'm tired, other things are more important, I'm not feeling my most confident self. You're going to find that routine is one of the most important parts of confidence. As you feel like you've, you've earned momentum in the day, as things are getting accomplished, you start to feel like a more live and whole version of yourself. So I place little obstacles in my life that I know I can accomplish so that if one's come up where I do not accomplish them that day, I still have the sensation of momentum. That sensation of momentum is extremely important to me as I feel more confident about the things I'm achieving then I start feeling better about the decisions I'm making in my day. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, um, you have to separate yourself from negative commentary coming from other people for the direction you're going. And you have to remember that nobody, nobody who is happy with the way they spent their last 24 hours would ever, ever second guess you for the way you're spending your 24 hours, for the way you're spending your life, you spent, you're spending your hours. No one who's doing things that they're genuinely fulfilled by would ever question you in the way you're spending your time. So when those things come about, you have to remember to check in with yourself and say, damn, who would take the time out of their day to uh, try to crucify me for the way that I'm living my life? Oh, of course, it's a bunch of people who are just unsatisfied with the way they're spending their time. People who are working a nine to five they hate for a boss they don't love and a job they know is a dead end in a life that is not fulfilling them are always going to question the people who are getting excited about something because that alone is what's threatening them. It's not the fact that you're looking better. It's not the fact that you're winning. It is not any of this stuff. It's the fact that they are not. And um, it doesn't mean you need to turn around and tell them that. Don't take the time. You don't have the time. You shouldn't have the time. But just remember that based on that fact alone, you shouldn't put too much weight in what they're saying. It's more about how they're feeling than about what you're actually doing. Um, it sounds cliche, but if you really internalize that little bit of advice, you won't be threatened by anybody who has a negative thing to say anymore. Um, and when it comes to an internet presence, and I'll tell you this right now, an internet presence of negativity, you'll find that you're romanticizing other people's opinions because you don't see that other person. So you're just assuming that they must have some, because we're used to people criticizing us who are coming from an authoritative place. People criticizing you who are your teachers, your professors, your coaches, your parents, people you respect from an authoritative place. So when it's negativity, we're ingrained that it's coming from the top down. So unfortunately on the internet, when you hear negativity, it feels like it's coming from an authoritative position and you internalize it as if that person has done something to fucking earn the fact that they just said that to you. They haven't. They haven't. They typed it from a couch, from a toilet, from sitting in front of a TV with a handful of chips, whatever it is, I promise you those people don't know shit. They don't care about shit. And they, anyone who has the energy to spout negativity towards someone they don't know is welcoming that kind of energy in their life. And I promise you don't want to know what that life looks like. Keep that in mind, move forward with your life and every one positive comment should boost you a little bit higher and remember we're all in this together and the people who aren't, they can just do their own thing. I appreciate all you guys. I'm going to go make my potatoes, my famous golden potatoes that I eat every single night of my life. I'm going to go get that done. If you want any more help or advice from me, follow me on Instagram, bradley.thor or go download my app, Oak, O-H-K. You guys are awesome. We'll talk soon.